This morning I, I looked up and I saw walking in uh, Linda and Dugan Reed. Are you glad to see Linda and Dugan here at church this morning? You know, I don't, I don't point people out too much, but those these folks have been a blessing to me throughout the years, back in the Bethesda days and the ball game days. Dugan probably threatened to throw me off the ball field a time. Or two. No, I don't think he did. Dugan umpired a whole lot back in the days and when I was coaching the kids coming up. And it was some good old days, though. And I just think back of those days. And when I see those people, it just brings back and refreshes the memories. Linda, what a wonderful job you've done with the Loving People Ministry. And we love you all for that. Dugan, I want you to know that we want to continue to pray for you and for the complete healing of your body and know God can do it. This morning as we come to you, we're coming to you from Joshua, the 24th chapter. I want to read a couple verses there. I've got 15 up there. I may have messed Sandy up, the 14th and 15th, if that's possible. If not, well, we can do it. Oh, look at her. She is so good. The 14th and 15th verse of Joshua. The title today that we're bringing and talking to you about in the sermon, if it's going to be, well, it's up to me. If it's going to be... It's up to me. You've heard that term used many a times by different people. Well, if it's going to be, it's going to be up to me because then nobody else going to do it. Listen, you're in charge of you. Remember that. Hold on to that and understand you and you alone are in charge of you. You, not your wife, not your boss, not your family, not your sister, your brother, not your children for sure. You're in charge of you. And children, you're in charge of you also. Yeah, you have some supervision now. Don't get me wrong. There's supervision that, that we've got to use some common sense. And there is the law that we pay attention to. And they, they're there to protect us, to serve us, to help us. And, and we understand that. Kids in school, your teacher is in charge of that classroom. But you, in that classroom, are in charge of you to have the best behavior that you can be and to understand uh, who you need to be, to, to be the best you can be. So let's look at 24 and 14. Here we're talking, Sandy brought this to my attention this morning. I had 15 up there, but uh, she was talking about, well, now, wait a minute, what's that talking about here? And I said, oh, me, Sandy, if you don't understand that, the people won't understand it. And I want to make sure anything that I ever say is understood. If it's something I say in a sermon at any time that you don't quite understand, you feel free to call me the next week and talk to me about it. Ask me questions. I want, and if I don't know, guess what I'll do? I'll tell you, and I'll dig deep to find out the answer. But this morning, as we read the Word of God in Joshua 24 and 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. 15 says... And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you want to serve. Whether it's the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river. By the way, that was false idols. That was false gods. It was just, may have been a big rock or something they worshipped. Could be the moon, the stars. Just, just, it was false gods is what you're talking about here. Choose for yourself this day whom you, though, will serve. You will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Father, add your blessings to this word in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I look at this, I, I look at this and my life, it, it took a giant leap forward when I, I got the vision of a personal responsibility. You know, sometimes we think it's somebody else's responsibility, and my life is, and they're supposed to take care of that and do this for me. Uh, but you see, Noah, Noah didn't expect God to build his ark. Do you think the ark would have got built if Noah wouldn't have pursued to the building of that ark? And he wouldn't have pressed through the, the naysayers and the, uh, the condemnation and the people throwing rocks and making fun of him and all of that. You think the ark would have ever got built? You know, his deal is, well, God's going to build the ark. My goodness, I'm just going to sit back and watch it. That ark would still have a pile of lumber laying there if that wouldn't have happened. You see, Noah didn't expect God to build that ark. God is the master planner, but he has left the building up to us. 
And I like the part that, that goes on to say after that, the Amorites in whose land you dwell, uh, you want to, to worship those? Or, but he went on to say, wait a minute, Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Around the world, on any given Sunday, people's going to meet in churches to hear a preacher or a teacher talk to them or preach to them about the love of God and what God has the power and the desire to do for us all around the world. Not many will be telling the people what their responsibility is. What, are there is, what is my responsibility, preacher? How about giving me what, what you're talking about here? You're telling me what all about this, but what's my responsibility? In any, any covenant, meaning agreement, it takes two parties. It takes two to tango. It takes two to reproduce. Perhaps the greatest thing that God has ever given to us is the privilege, power of choice. Joshua's words, choose this day whom you're going to serve, tells us this, that you, you alone, are responsible to choose and that you have the privilege and the power to choose right or wrong. Those words tell us you're in charge of your destiny. God is not in charge of your destiny. God designs your destiny. And you're grabbing this, I'm hoping. But you must discover your destiny. You, you don't, don't try to look at your husband to discover it. Don't look at somebody else. It's you, honey. It's you that's in charge of your destiny. Let me say it another way. The future you experience is the future you create. Just as Noah built the ark over a period of time, you and I are building our future one day at a time. One choice at a time. One act of obedience at a time. Your future and your destiny is not a miracle or a mystery. You see, it's a harvest. There is a very powerful verse here in Hosea 8 and 7. It says, They sow, they sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no head. It will produce no flower. Were it, were it to yield grain... Were it to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up. Mm. Uh, you see here, notice, they reaped exactly what they sowed. They sowed the wind, but they reaped a tornado. You cannot blame anyone for the life you have, good or bad, because you created it by your choices. Come on, preacher, don't be hard on me. Don't be hard on me. Don't, don't, don't. Throw me away. I mean, listen, I'm not, but I'm telling you, I'm just trying to get you to understand, and you and me too, to understand that we are in charge of our destiny. We're in charge of tomorrow. We're in charge of today, of us. And the best we can do is, is to take care of us. Lots of times we like to try to take care of everybody else's business and try to help them and try to get them on the right foot. That's wonderful and that's good. But listen, the main thing that you've got to do is make sure you've got yourself planted. You've got to make sure that you're serving the God that you need to serve. Not the God that is a God of an idol. Not the God of a job or, 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 or a boat or, or a mall or, or a golf course. You see, all of these things can become gods to us. When, when we seem to think more of that, you know, maybe even a vehicle, maybe even your car, your automobile. It may be just you're obsessed with cutting of your grass and, and weed eating. And if you are, you need to get over that and come out to my house and let me give you the best weed eater that you can ever find. And you can just enjoy it all day long. Oh, I got, I got a bite there, I think. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, folks, listen, it's your choice. Yes, I know that many things can happen in life and can affect you for better or worse, but ultimately no one can choose your destiny but you. You can't always control what happens, but you are the governor of what happens in you. We never have to worry about God being faithful, do we? Is He faithful? 
Yes, He is. We never have to worry about there being enough power. He's got the power. We realize He's all power in heaven and on earth. My goodness, a creator of this earth, the person who suspended the world into midair, put the sun and the moon in the perfect position. If the sun moved a half an inch, we would freeze to death. If it moved away from us, if it moved toward us a half an inch, we'd burn up. Can you imagine how in the world can that exist that the perfection of that, it's nothing but the power. The power of a God that's able to suspend this world in midair and keep it moving forward. We never have to worry about God loving us. We never, we never need to call God's mercy into question. It is what it is. God is love and He always will be. So where does that leave us? That leaves us in the same place that Joshua was in. The place of decision. I've got to choose. Decisions decide destiny. Destiny. Change happens at the speed of your decisions. Can you either run into your future or crawl into it? You can either run into it or you, you want to run into your future or you just want to crawl into it. Your future can be gross or it can be glorious. God designs destiny. You discover it. God designs. He's the designer. Does a great job. But we've got to discover it on our own. Quit whining and start shining. Quit looking down and look up. Get your head up. Hold your shoulders up. Press on to the mark of the high calling. Well, you don't know what I'm going through with, Pastor. I have to do this. I... Whoa, you don't know what everybody's going through. Everybody's going through something. It's how we deal with it that makes the difference. That's the things that I've learned myself in the last few years. Oh, how precious life is. How precious it is to keep our eyes focused on a God that loves us better than anyone in this world could ever love us. And we need to start our day with God. We need, to, we need to, even throughout the day, we need to have that God showing up in us, through us, and to us. And at the end of the day, give Him some glory and thank Him for the day and ask Him for that good night's rest. You can discover all oh, that, that wonderful destiny of yours. Your decisions decided. Joshua exhorted the people to choose. Then he was quick to say, I've made my decision. As for me and my house... We're going to serve the Lord. What decisions are you making today that are affecting your future? After accepting Jesus into your life, the most important decision you will ever make is to obey the presence that lives within you. And that being the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, Pastor, what are you talking about when you say, uh, after I, I accept Jesus into my life, you know you've heard me say it many times, I've explained it well to you, that when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, your life, the, you're, you're, you're obeying the Bible, the Word of God, in Romans 10.9, it says, confess with your mouth. Lord, I, I don't know what to do really, but... I know that I know that there's a God, and I don't know all about you, God, but I just know you're there. And most of all, I see some of my friends, and I see how they're living, and and they love you, God. And and I see some things that they're doing and saying, and and, and, and they treat me kind, and and they they help me. And when I'm really hurting, God, I look around, and there they are. Is that you, God? Is that you? Is that what I... That's Because that's what I'm wanting. That's what I want in my life. So, God, forgive me of my sins and come live in me. Let your Spirit move in me. I believe in you, Jesus. I want to tell you, is it that simple? Yes, that's the biblical Word of God. But after you do that, Guess what? Grace steps in. The amazing grace. The unmerited what? Favor. The favor of God flows. And the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said that every one of us could have is available for you. And then the presence of His Spirit dwells within you. 
You're saying, wow, he's with me. Was he with me last night? Was he with me when I went to the cleaners the other day and, and I barked at the lady? Was he with me when I said, those stains around that neck, that's not going to get it. She couldn't understand me real well. And I said, around here, no. My blood sugar had dropped. So when I go back, I'm going to carry a rose or something. I'm going to do better. I, but you understand what I'm saying? When the Spirit of God moves in you, you, yes, sometimes you're going to be stupid and you're going to say something dumb or you're going to do something you shouldn't do. But listen, you shouldn't continue in that. Somebody said, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I sin every day. Well, honey, if you're sinning every day, you need to do something about it. Whatever that thing is that's trying to hinder you, you need to get it out of. You need to pray about it and say, God, I don't know. I, I'm not handling this good. This is the weakness that I've got. I've got to think about it right now. Every one of you, come on, every one of you. I want you to think about it. Every one of you has some kind of little weakness. You don't want to admit it, but remember, you're in charge of you. Every one of you, I want you to think about what's your weakness. Now you think about that. So why do you still have it? Do you know the power that works within you is Jesus Christ? And He doesn't want anything to weight you down. And, and, and if you continue to carry that sin around and you continue to wallow in that, it's going to continue to pull you sideways. And you're not going to be able to walk too straight. You're not going to be able to think too straight because you're going to be irritable sometimes. Yeah, you're going to be irritable sometimes. That's going to happen. But when you do, you, you think about that very weakness and say, you know what? I am not having it in the name of Jesus. Why are you saying all this, Pastor? You need to stay with your notes because you're getting too far away. No, I'm not because I've got to get you to understand we are in charge of us. The Holy Spirit is where I wanted you to grab a hold of there. The Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher. Now, when you ask Jesus in your heart, the Spirit of God moved in you. So that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher, the greatest instructor, and the greatest mentor. Where is this Holy Spirit? Well, this Spirit lives within you if you've asked Jesus to live in your heart. Remember this, decisions decide destiny. God decides your harvest, 30, 60, or 100 fold. But your decision to sow schedules your harvest. Your decision to sow sparingly determines that your harvest is going to come back sparingly. Your decision to sow generously determines that your harvest will come back to you generously. Oh my goodness, isn't that some good stuff? Well, I, I look in it, at uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and 6, and it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That's what I just said, right? Now, now let's look at something else, talking about sowing. Go to Luke 6 and 38. Luke 6 and 38 says, Give... And it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. What in the world he put all that in there for? Why do you have to put so much? Because sometimes we're ignorant. If he'd said given and be given to you, we'd, we'd just say, oh. But look, he's wanting, he's wanting to add to it and say it's a, in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you give, it will be measured back to you. One of the sweetest little things happened last week that made my week, okay? It made my week. Just absolutely. I, I get away and the next day I see a little text come across the line or whatever that, that uh, a little girl, six years old, had a birthday. Her name's Emma. Emma was here last week. And hey, she's here today. And Emma when they passed the plate around for Nadine and Delbert, guess what Emma did? Emma was given money for her birthday. She had $20. Now, you help me out, six-year-olds. She gave her, she gave her $20. Put it in there. She said, I want to give that to Miss Nadine. 
Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Give and it shall be given back to you. Wasn't that precious? Isn't that good? Mom and Dad's already teaching this baby about giving. Already teaching this baby about how to love others and how to help others and reach out and be kind to others. Mom and Dad is already doing a wonderful job at that. This little child is six years old. I want to say to you, when we give, it'll be given back. Well, I think before she left church, she had $15 that was just handed to her by various people when they saw that act of kindness. And then Neil looked over at it and he said, no, let me go ahead and top that off and make that the full 20. He dumped another five on top of it. You understand? Know, see what's happening here? But it's, it's a gift of love and it's a gift out of love that little Emma cared. I just need to share with you, give and it shall be given back. Oh, and such a blessing when you see the little children and they're giving like they do. Let me ask you some very important questions. Who have you decided to listen to? Whose words have you decided uh, to listen to? Whose words have you decided to believe? Where do you go to church? What part of God's Word have you decided to believe? The only part that works for you is the part you believe. What part of God's Word have you chosen to obey? What about uh, God's Word have you chosen to ignore? There, there, there's that word, choose again. We're, we're using the choose word. What battles have you chose to fight or you've chose to ignore? What, what have you chose to honor? What have you failed to honor? Every sin is birthed out of honor. Dishonor for parents. Dishonor for husband or wife. Dishonor for an employer. Uh, dishonor for God and His Word. Or, the, or dishonor for authority. The police department, the government, dishonor for yourself. You can go to the prison and you'll find that every person there is there because they chose to dishonor. Your life today is the product of the fruit of your decision. Your fruit, your future is being decided by your decisions today. Jeremiah 29 and 11 in the Living Bible, it says it this way. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. That's God, isn't it, Tina? That's God. He, he's not planning to give us bad. His plans is for a future. And He's a planning for us some hope. And I'm so thankful for that. There are plans for good, not evil. The thought here is that God has plans for your life and mine. He already designed the blueprint for your life. But He is not going to build my house or your house. God designed and created His world with His words. Now it's up to you to create your world with your words. And it's up to me to create my world with my words. I'm going to give you a shock treatment here. And, and you just need to kind of get ready for it just a minute. A sinner that boldly speaks what they believe has more creative power working for them than a born-again, spirit-filled, Bible-toting, pew-jumping, aisle-running, cross-wearing child of God. What? Why? Yes, you heard it right. It's the law of confession and it works for anyone who works it. The Bible declares that death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's why this, this tongue is... Is a deadly weapon if you're not careful. You need to understand that. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 18.21 tells us this. It says in 20, From the fruit of their mouth a person's stomach is filled with the harvest of their lips, and they are satisfied. But the tongue has the power of life and death. Oh, do you hear it today? A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Oh, notice that it doesn't say a godly man or a righteous man or a holy man. It just says a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Spiritually speaking, many people in the world have full, fat bellies. But many believers have flat, empty bellies because there is no fruit of their lips because they aren't speaking God's Word. Jesus said, by your words you are justified, or, or by, by your words you are condemned. 
So therefore, we need to speak words that are of a good report, would you think? Not shame, blame, condemnation, would you think? But peace, love, joy, forgiveness. That's God. He's wanting to give us your hope. He's the one that wants to help you through your battles, through your struggles and your problems. God created His world with His Word. What kind of world are you creating today with your words? What kind of world am I creating with my words? Every Noah and Miss Noah must build his or her own boat. God gives us the material. He gives us the blueprint. But you decide what kind of boat you want. The boat represents your future. It represents your life. Do you want an ocean liner? Or will you be satisfied with a rowboat? I am not authorized to build your life. The future, the future you desire is waiting for you to create it. It's not too late to start now. You're saying, wow, wished I would have known that many years ago. Wished I would have took charge of me many years ago and said, you know what? I'm going to get rid of the things that hinder me. I'm going to get rid of the things in my mind or, or little habits that I've got, the sinful nature. I've got to stop this because mm, I can't be my very best me when I'm letting the things of the world, other idols, if you will, and that can be sins. Other idols can be sins that rob you and pull you away from what God wants you to have. The best you, you can be. The blueprint is there. The creation is there. Now it's what you do with it that makes the difference. The future you desire is waiting. Call oh, for you to create it. The power. Well, is that the Holy Spirit? The power? Come on, born-again Christians. You have that. That is also an added attraction within you, that power that God, the Holy Spirit, that He gives to you when you give your heart to Him. You have the materials, God's Word. Now it's time to create. Because if it's going to be, it's up to me. Now that's not just me saying that. If this church is going to be, it's up to me. No. It's not just up to me if this church is going to be. It's up to us. Each one of us saying that very statement. It's going to be, it's up to me. Now I'm closing. I want you to know that this is ending. Ephesians 3 and 20. Very powerful verse that I love very much. It says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly immeasurably more abundantly than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us. To Him, 21 says, be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Who, who are you? Buddy, you're the best you can be, right? Look at you. You don't realize it, girl, but you're sitting next to the best. You look at it. Look at it right now. Look right at it. Say, I'm the best. <laughs> I'm the best I can be because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him work through me. But you see, I've got to take charge of me and, and put it into action. Until I do that, it's just words. But when I step into the action and start, man, you mean a lot to me. You worked yesterday and sweat was pouring off of you trying to put that gold up with you. It's pretty awesome, dude. Boy, you just make me happy when I see you. I want to say something to you, God. Thank you for being too fine in the world. And we're going to work on it. So if we don't, it ain't going to be right. If it's going to be, it's up to. Amen. Would you stand with me?